Hey folks, this is Johnny and welcome to another Home Studio Trainer Live. It's good to see everybody. And today we are going to be doing songwriting simplified with our good friend, Johnny Lipsham. So uh, hopefully you guys are uh, up for this subject. Uh, I am definitely always up for learning a little bit more about music theory. But uh, what I wanted to do is I wanted to ask Johnny what he thought the basics would be. Uh, the best way for someone like me and maybe even some of you out there, where would you start? Where would you start with basics for music theory? Things that you should learn from the beginning. Let's actually find out what that is. I want to thank Louis from Alps Media for sponsoring today's show. Very cool. And let's see here. If I shrink that and expand that. And hit the dinger. Let's see if Johnny's home. Hello. Oh, <laughs> reverb. Go away, reverb. Uh, you let it go for quite some time. Don't worry, I'm changing the mic now. <laughs> Yeah, Skype was not answering the call. That yeah, what the heck is up with that? You need to switch your mic again. I know, I know, I know. It. <laughs> I'm getting there. Get with the program. <laughs> dun, dun, dun. There we go. That should be better. Wait, maybe yep. that's... Is that it? Yeah. Oh, okay, that's not the channel that I was looking for, but as long as it sounds good. Yeah, then, it sounds good. Then I don't care. <laughs> All right, so how are you, my friend? I am good. Very cool. It's bloody cold here. Oh it's my, yeah. In a freezer in a freezer. <laughs> Through a freezer in a freezer. You know what the only... <laughs> We have a bathroom that's right by our front door. And I'm going to tell you, that is the coldest mother loving toilet seat to sit on. Like, especially when you get up in the middle of the night. You're tired. You're like, oh man, I got to go to the bathroom. And if you got to sit down, you say, go, oh, oh, oh Jesus. <laughs> uh, because it's like right by the door quick. yeah <laughs> exactly and that's how cold it is here so <laughs> i don't know why i went i went that way but there we go all right so anyway we already have 14 people in here we got a really good connection according to youtube which is good uh we got 14 people in any me over my shoulder uh, oh okay. that's the uh, little that's that's the little johnny there it's uh it's your conscience. That's the evil one. And this is a good one. <laughs> <clears throat> okay. <laughs> Enough nonsense. So John Edgar has a question right out of the blocks here. He says, how is 20th century music different from other eras? And how does that benefit modern composers across various genres? Wow. I, boy, I, that's a good question. I don't, I don't think you can, I don't think you can, you can divide the music by century. Can you? Because yes, you, can. Yep. you can, because things for me really started to change in the eighties and nineties and into the, into the next century. But, but I think the change started, you know, before the turn of the century, don't you think or no? Well, I mean, when we're talking 20th century music, we're talking, you know, everything from, um, you know, kind of late vaudeville and onwards, really. And, you know, late, late music hall. So anything from like 1895 onwards, you know. So you're talking the end of what we would call in classical in classical music language, we'd call that the end of the romantic period, uh -huh. the 20th century period, which we now call the 20th century period, which really we should call the modern era. The reason yes. being is because there have been so many freaking innovations between, you know, 1900 and 2022. Oh, incredible. You, you, you've got to call it the modern era, um, you know, because, you know, you, you obviously have the medieval period, you have the Baroque period, you have the classical period, you have the romantic period. Those are kind of like the four main kind of eras of um, music. Uh, over the last sort of uh, 800 years, maybe. And, uh, you know, and that's not including music that predates 
kind of like the medieval period. So, you know, uh, music like plain song, um, Gregorian chant that, that dates back to like the the late 900s AD. Right. So, you know, there's there's all of that music. So, you know, how, how are we to compare kind of the music of the modern period, the modern era? I, I can't even speak. <laughs> the modern, I'm, I'm getting like era and period kind of <laughs> combined. So it ends up going period. <laughs> or period. <laughs> Or a pitya. What is an idiot or an idiot? Exactly. Yeah. Um, before so I had compared those to kind of what came before. Well, it that that's hard because if you take the last hundred and thirty years, um, there have been so many different things that have happened in that very very short space of time. If you compare the innovations, music innovations of the last 130 years to the previous 130 years, music history is kind of my specialism, really. Oh, um, good. Uh, you know, prior to 1900, change in music was actually relatively slow. Kind of things would take 50 or 60 years to kind of develop and change and evolve. Whereas in you know in the the 20th and 21st centuries so far everything's been like okay we'll do this for a bit they're oh, let's do this now this is it's it's as if you know um music has is somehow acquired adhd uh and so you know <laughs> it's kind of like one thing develops very quickly into another so if you take popular what i'm going to call broadly popular music so okay. that would include kind of music hall vaudeville um uh, uh, Tin Pan Alley from the 1920s, 1930s, then into swing, then into bebop, then into cool jazz, then into funk and fusion and pop and rock and right. rock and belly, country, all of that, um, that we broadly call classical, uh, popular music, not classical music. Um, you know, you could, you could look at that and you could go, actually, all of that music is kind of a little microcosm of what happens in, you know, kind of the development of classical music. It kind of mirrors it to some degree, except every kind of development is really, really tiny in terms of time comparatively, because um, you have like, you know, you have uh, the the swing period from like maybe the late 19 teens, maybe from about the end of the First World War until like the early middle 1940s that was the swing period and then you have charlie parker and dizzy gillespie and bebop which is which actually only lasts about five or six years right and then you get cool jazz and you get rock and roll kind of developing as a reaction to what was happening with with modern jazz uh kind of and and you know going back to blues roots and all of that kind of happening all at the same time then and developments with electrifying instruments all happening at the same time and those periods have been really really short uh and there's a clear definition between one and the next whereas with classical music kind of although we have these four broad eras there is quite some overlap so there's some overlap between you know the end of mozart's life and uh beethoven and the beginning of the romantic period because beethoven sure. kind of us, you know, has his feet in both camps because he he learned from people like Mozart. He was a student of Mozart's. Some would say there's lots of debate about that, but sure, uh, you know. So he kind of grew up with kind of the music of the classical period, but then he kind of what he studied, he then kind of then built upon, much like Mozart had done before him. And so you get into more complex harmony and bigger orchestras and then of course because beethoven by this point is profoundly deaf he thinks let's add some guns to this <laughs> 1812 overture yeah you know, i think it's the final movement of the, uh, the the final section of the 1812 overture there's bloody cannons in it yeah, wow it's just like okay well, you know, it's, you know, first I want to respond to Bobby Booth telling us that it's 80 degrees where he lives. And I think everybody who is pretty much uh, who's living in a cold state is collectively going. <laughs> so, so there you go, Bobby. But, uh, man, that's only because we're jealous. Um, anyway, um, 
So, you know, the other parts that you have to kind of look at, and I've been watching the chat a little bit. You know, Brett uh, Marler was talking about burlesque period, the period before musicians got paid, <laughs> and, <laughs> uh, and everything else. What I'm kind of looking at, too, is the is the technology part of it. There there would be there would be so much musical genres missing now without the technology part. Now there was a time where I was against loops and samples and I heard some great songs composed with loops that actually contained popular uh, samples from popular songs that I couldn't have identified if I had tried. And, uh, but you know, you got all these companies that are doing the, um, uh, that are doing the, um, hold on a second. Let me take care of something here, uh, that are, um, that are doing, uh, the loop libraries and Mm -hmm. they are hiring musicians to actually, they're hiring musicians to create loops that anybody can use. And, you know, I get the question a lot. You know, if I get some of these sample libraries from Personas and I go ahead and I create a song using one of them, what if somebody else uses that that loop? Well, Mm -hmm. since the loop started out as general to everybody, you know, kind of open, you can use it. It it doesn't matter. The thing is, is that they can copyright their song, but they can't copyright that section of the loop. That's what I've actually found out uh, Mm -hmm. from a friend of mine that works at BMI. And, uh, you know, he just says, yeah, he said there is some discussion about that with loop libraries and people, you know, actually filing to say, Hey, I use that loop in my song. It's like, well, that loop was actually free, you know, and it was public domain basically. And, uh, if he used it in his song and you used it in your song, you can copyright every other piece of your song, but you can't copyright that. You can't sue for that loop. You know, and so, but it is complicated. It isn't. It isn't as, um, uh, you know, straightforward as that. But uh, again, the technology. I think the uh, that technology has created genres, and unfortunately, without a doubt. I mean, you know, you think about this for for a moment. If if you take away, um, the technology, starting with amplification, oh yeah, and you know, electronic recording. So we're we're talking, you know the late 1940s experiments with, uh, well, middle 1940s experiments using, you know, electric microphones yes. rather than you know, recording into into a, a horn directly onto a stylus like you would have yeah. to in the 1920s. You know, um, uh, let's take, a, take away all of that. Pretend none of that ever happened. And we're still recording onto a stylus. So we're, right. we're and we're still recording onto whack, onto like, um, um, like um a, an acetate right the, cil- uh, the cylinders yeah so you know we're kind of stuck with that that's where we are um we would still be listening to music of that period probably i yeah. would think and the reason why and there would certainly be no bass and there would certainly be no <clears throat> kick drum right because that makes the cutting stylus jump yeah so no bass guitar no upright bass no kick drum so the music's going to sound very, very thin compared to what we're used to now. Right. And like you say, you know, no amplification, therefore no electric guitars. So people like Chuck Berry would would never have happened. Yeah, right. Charlie yeah. Christian would would uh, would uh, never have kind of pioneered all that he did with the with the electric guitar. Oh. And therefore you would have no Jimi Hendrix, and therefore you would have no John McLaughlin and no Alan Holdsworth. And so, and that's just talking just just guitar, right? Um, you know, there's a whole host of other things that we could talk about that we could spend all day. Oh, talking sure, about. yeah. This should be um, a subject for a show all in its own. Yeah, but I mean, take away all of that technology, and I would I would argue that the kind of developments that we've talked about in music, uh, and uh, compositionally as well as everything else would have <laughs> happened over a much broader protracted time. We probably would still be, be listening to big band music, to be honest. Oh yeah. Well, so now let's actually take our subject for today and actually apply that to this question. How do you, th- if we were stuck with those recording mediums, like you say, no bass, no kick drum and things like that, would that have affected music theory in, in any way, shape or form? If the 
progress and the progression of music or is it really or is it really an entity of its own i'm, I'm just I think, saying, yeah i think, think technology has had definitely uh, an impact on how quickly music moved forward gotcha um gotcha. but from a music theory standpoint i think those um, you know, developments to do with harmony in particular, because that and form, those are probably the two biggest ways in which music has changed and developed over the last 130 years. Right. Um, because everything is kind of like derived from how we have, you know, what kind of tones and sounds we have in our harmonic palette and also the form, the form of, of the compositions that, that we are working with, you know, you know, uh, Wagner and, you know, uh, his extended, extended symphonic works, which were basically based on things that Beethoven had done, but extending that massively. Oh, interesting. Um, uh, Kyle just said here, he says, equal temperament was a huge innovation. Absolutely. If there was no equal temperament, then nothing in the classical period could have ever have taken place because a lot of the reason why we have the harmonic palette of the classical period and even, you know, the, the late Baroque period um, of Bach and the uh, 48 Preludes and Fugues, which is all kind of a celebration of equal temperament, that would never have happened if there was no equal temperament. If there hadn't been this, this decision to have uh, an equal gap between the semitone all the way across the keyboard from bottom to top. Oh, I see. Okay, yeah, I was kind of getting lost there for a second. Yeah, as far that, as gapping, but that makes sense. As if that had never happened, if that um, innovation, which is which is all kind of based on um, Pythagoras, Pythagorean mathematics to do with <laughs> wow. the harmonic series and that kind of thing, um, which is way too complicated to get into. But <laughs> sure, <laughs> um, had that not happened, you wouldn't be able to do this. You wouldn't be able to do a two five one. Oh. And you would there was there would be certain keys that would never get written in, like E flat. Nobody would ever write in E flat. Why? Because with previous forms of intonation, E flat would sound horrible, and it does. Like you know, if you deliberately um, write for period, what we would call period instruments now, um, right. like a, a period chamber orchestra from the Baroque period, the early Baroque period. And therefore, you tune everything accordingly, so like to 416 instead of 440. And uh, you take away this equal temperament, uh, the 12-tone the equal temperament that we're used to, where the, the, the octave is divided into 12 equal semitones. Then suddenly, some instruments work well together and some instruments don't. And so that has a massive implication on what you can write for, what keys you can write for. Right. And so everything is much more limited as to what you can do. Oh, so, that means you couldn't use certain instruments with certain, with, with other certain instruments or certain chord structures and things like that, right? Well, certain key signatures even. Oh, so you certain key write, signatures. Yeah, you couldn't write a song in E flat because it would sound great on your keyboard, but if you introduce <laughs> a cello to it, it's going to, the cello is going to be out of tune. Yeah, it's going to miss now, notes. Now, compensate because there's no frets on their instruments, so they can just adjust. But if you've got something like a clarinet. Um, yeah, you can't adjust those. They can't adjust those. Yeah. At least they couldn't back then. They can now because we've got all of these extra keys and, and things that are on the <laughs> yeah. clarinet that kind of help that. But I know. But, but before then, you couldn't. There was nothing you could do about it. It just wouldn't work. It, would, it wouldn't sound right. So equal temperament had a, a massive, massive impact upon how music, whether classical or what we would now call modern popular music, would develop because there would be no equal temperament. Oh, sure. Hey, do me a it, favor. It's mind-blowing to think about. It's a t that is a wonderful question. Yeah. Uh, take a look at Secret Squirrel's question. Uh, it's up above. Uh, he says, uh, I'm recently attempting to understand modes. I'd like to ask for relative modes. I'm understanding correctly that mode half, uh, whole half patterns on major scales. Yes. Okay. Yes. The the most common modes that, that uh, we refer to, things like Aeolian, Ionian, Dorian, Mixolydian, Phrygian, all of those modes are based on the major scale. 
you're just starting the major scale on a different note. So instead of starting on C, you start it on D and you get Dorian mode. And so on and so forth, all the way up, all seven steps. Oh, that's interesting. White, and white notes. Um, but there are also, so those are kind of major modes. We, um, we call them modes of the major scale. There are also modes of the minor scale. Now, the thing to bear in mind here is that you have the harmonic minor and you have the melodic minor. So you can have two sets of modes and all of them are a little bit unique and a little bit weird, but they sound glorious, let me tell you. Um, but they all have slightly weird names because if I take this um, C minor scale here, So there's our C minor scale. Now, if I start that on D and finish it on the D above, listen to what it sounds like. Uh, it sounds really, really not very resolved. <laughs> yeah. Right? Yeah. Hey. It sounds utterly weird, right? So that is what we would call, um, this is actually called Dorian flat two, flat six, believe it or not. Sure. Because it's got a flat two, because it goes D to E flat, but it's also got a flat six with the A flat here. It's weird. It's just an utterly balmy scale, but it sounds, it sounds fantastic. Now, um, D deriving chords from that scale, they're going to sound a little bit weird because you're only using notes from that scale. Um, so you know things like E flat major. E flat major is going to sound nice. You can have a nice E flat major major chord there, um, and then your your minor chord is going to sound maybe a little bit like this because you've got the flat six and the flat two. So um, there's some interesting chords you can kind of derive from that scale and there's like i said there's like seven other modes of the melodic minor seven modes of the harmonic minor scale as well yeah wayne is uh hoping you teach this stuff at your day job <laughs> but you don't uh i i used to well i i, I can i kind of still do in the summertime i i, I run a, a summer school for um postgraduate students oh really i didn't know that yeah, yeah so um but yeah i used to be a lecturer um, at university. You, well, you've got the knowledge for sure. <laughs> so, so, um, so, you know, based on uh, secret squirrels question, um, uh, in, in my own mind, I should say. So a lot of this, that a lot of this, that you're uh, going through with uh secret squirrels, um, uh, question, um, when it comes to, and I'm getting this question from Leon over on on Wix, and um, is there a point in, and this is his question, is there a point in learning music theory where you, where you have to stop and practice what you learn, or can you gain an understanding? Uh, I'm not quite sure what word this is. Uh, can you gain an understanding uh, based, and let's see, he's retyping here. Oh, I think I, oh, okay. I, do, do you think you know where he's going? I think I know where he's going. All yeah, right. I think so. All right, answer it the way it is there. All right, and I'm I'm sure Leon can kind of expand a little bit as well. Sure, to, yeah, he's still typing. But, he's still typing. Um, but uh, here's my view: you absolutely can get your head very, very deep into music theory. You can go all the way down the rabbit hole into wonderland and never leave and get <laughs> totally stuck there. And you end up marrying Alice and probably have lots of very tiny children <laughs> um, uh, and get totally lost in that, in that world. You, you absolutely can. However, um, my personal view is, is this, I think there is no point to having all of that mental understanding of music theory without the practical application. 
right, you don't he, have to practically apply it to your own music, your own works, your own compositions, your own improvisations. There's no point in having all of that information. Right. Well, well, he said that he, uh, a friend of his told him, and he explained his question. He said a friend of his told him that it doesn't make any sense to learn music theory if you only play one instrument. I don't, I, I don't, know, I don't know that I... You agree? I disagree. Oh, good. Yeah, I do too. <laughs> I, I absolutely disagree. You know, here's the thing. Even if you are just a flute player, and that's all you do. You just play the flute. You love playing the flute. You have no desire to play any other musical instrument whatsoever. Flute is your thing. Flute is how you express how you express yourself musically. Right. You're going to need a, a very very solid understanding of harmony, a very solid understanding of melody. You're going to have to have good um, understanding of scales and modes and all of those things. Why? Because you need to be able to apply them to making melodies. Ah. Uh -huh. Yep. And to improvisation. If you're going to play with other musicians as a, as a flute player, even if you're playing in an orchestra and you're just playing what's on the charts, so you're basically doing what the composers already told you to do, you're still going to have to have an understanding of how the notes work together um, so that you make sure that the phrasing of your, um, of your lines that you're being asked to play work well within the section that you're in. So if you're in the flute section, you're going to be playing with other flute players. You're going to be able to, you're going to have to be able to listen to them so that you make sure that you play absolutely completely in sync with those other flute players. Oh yeah. Especially when it comes to certain instruments need a uh, specific tuning in order to play with other instruments, you know, yep. but uh, yeah. <laughs> Leon says, thank you so much for doing that. He says, he says, I was going to sign up locally to, uh, to a class to learn a little bit of music theory. Uh, and he says, yeah. you know, he almost didn't after what his friend said. So he says, no, thank no, no, you for the information. Sign up for that class. Learn as much as you can. Oh, and it's actually just... post a link uh, to uh, yours, your videos uh, for music theory. Yeah, I can certainly do that. Yeah. Um, yeah, sign up, learn as much as you can about music because music is a language and the more you the more you know a language, the more you are able to communicate with others and the more you're able to understand other people communicating with you and the, therefore the, the, the deeper you can interact with other people on an emotional and mental level. Right. That's it, you know? So, you know, there are people that, that, that will basically throw the baby out with the bathwater. They'll say, <laughs> I don't want to have anything to do with music theory. And it's just like, okay, so play me a G major chord, then play me an A minor chord, then play me a D7 chord. Why does that work? Why does that sound good? <laughs> yeah, right. Don't ask me to do that. Half of the chords I play, I don't know what they are. And, <laughs> and that's, a, that's an example of that's an example of really not understanding music theory the way that it stands. I mean, although I've gotten away with it all these years because I just play off of ear, which a lot of musicians do. Ikiri, um, uh, uh, Ikiria Fuki, uh, if a Kube that did all the music, uh, for Godzilla, um, movies and stuff. And some of that stuff is just so intense, such intense music. You know, he admitted in an interview that he did everything by ear up to a certain point when things just stopped working. He says, I had to, I had to learn, I had to learn what to do with what I have. And he said, music theory was a big part of it. So it's very cool. All right. We have 26 people in here. All right. So, um, we're about halfway through and we've, we've already kind of answered some really good questions, yeah, but yeah. Um, I thought it would be a, a, a good thing to kind of go over some bare bones basics. Okay. That I think everybody should have a grasp of, and some of this is stuff that we have all, we have covered over many, many different shows. Right. Um, so we talked about there, the major scale, which has its own kind of unique half, step whole whole step kind of composition right so if we started on c and we go up to the c above then we're going up by a whole step to d another whole step then a half step to f a whole step a whole step a half step up to the octave so that's the composition of a major scale which means you can take that and you can move that 
any way you like and start it on any note you like and you'll get the same thing. So if I start it on E flat here, so E flat, up a whole tone, uh, to F, up another whole, up another half, up a whole, up a whole, up a whole, uh, up a half at the end there. All right? Now, what do we notice there? What we noticed there is I had to play three black notes in E flat, an A flat, and a B flat. Congratulations, you have just discovered the key signature for E flat major. <laughs> an e flat, yeah, that's pretty cool. flat, and a B flat. All right. So if I then drop that down by a that whole scale by a half step to D, so we go D, up a step, up another step, up a half step. Up a step, up a step, up a step, up a half step. Now, we played two different black notes this time. We played an F sharp and a C sharp. Once again, you've just discovered the key of D major and its key signature, F sharp and C sharp. So oh, all of this, cool. you can either learn by doing what I just did, or you can learn it by sitting down and looking at a sheet of paper that says, here's the notes that make up the D major scale, and it has a key signature of T sharps, F sharp, and C sharp. And then you just learn, you just memorize that stuff. You can do it either way, or you can do it by a combination of both methods. I think both have equal validity. Oh, one yeah. is practical, one is a little bit more kind of, um, uh, you know, learning vocabulary. And vocabulary is, if, music, if we're regarding music as a language like French or Spanish or German, then, you know, the things that we learn uh, notation-wise and key signatures and things like that, that's all our vocabulary. This is the practical application. This is where you learn to speak the language. Yeah, see, I actually learn better if I do it first and have to write the notes out myself yeah. rather than read them and apply them and then read them again. Mm -hmm. Because if I like for my job, which really gets so deep into programming and stuff, which I'm I'm not into necessarily, but, you know, it's a good job and all. You know, when my boss actually shows me something and he gives me documentation, what I'll do and he, he likes this idea, too. Uh, what I'll do is I'll turn on OBS on my work laptop and I'll record our session together. And then what I'll do is I'll go back through that and go through it a couple of times myself with the video on one side and the server or whatever I have on the other side. And then I'll write it out and then I'll compare it to the notes that he gave me that, you know, most people would actually have to read first before anything. And, mm -hmm. and I usually find out that it pretty much matches, but... But the way that I wrote it down is very much layman's terms. Mm -hmm. And and I just learn better that way. And and, and I think that yep. I think for me it would be better to watch one of your videos or to take a class where somebody shows me something, but I can replay it and re understand and listen to the parts that I missed. Um, I, it, it's, that's just the way that, uh, the way that I learned. So I'm, I'm glad you said that, you know, a combination of the two works so well. Yeah. A lot of people are like that. Um, uh, Bobby says here, he says, you have to draw me a picture. And actually, you know what? There's a lot of people who are like that too. They are visual learners. Yeah. If they have something drawn for them or displayed for them, then it's easier for them to, to, to get a grasp of. So something like, you know, the, the infamous circle of fifths diagram, it would, would be something that would help Bobby. <laughs> Providing he then has somebody then explain how that circle works. Yeah, I'm right there with you, Bobby. <laughs> Don't then, worry. Absolutely. You could, you know, he would then be able to um, look at that diagram and understand how, how each works. And then the seed, the, the key thing is, is to take that information from the, the circle of fifths diagram or the, you know, the the key signatures and things like that put it to work put it to work and figure it out you know if you're not sure how a major scale is composed if you know some of the building blocks to start with like you know that you're going to be going from a c to a c that's building block number one and then you just play all the white notes between those and then you just look at the gap between each note and you go okay that's a tone that's a tone 
that's a half. That's a whole tone, whole tone, whole tone, half tone. Aha, we've got a pattern here. And then you can move that pattern around to, and start it on a different note. And you'll find that you'll have to use different combinations of different black keys in order to make that have the same composition. Interesting. Now, now I've heard people refer to the black keys as the sad keys. You know, when it when it comes to music theory, is that is is that accurate or because I don't necessarily see them as sad keys. They can be, but they can also be not sad. It 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 kind of depends because all of these notes in our glorious twelve tone equal temperament. <laughs> They all have relationships. Yeah, they do. They all have a relationship together. So major third, minor third, right? Major, uh, sorry, minus, uh, minor second, major second. Ugh. Yeah, exactly. So <laughs> some of them sound a little bit more ugly than others. So, right. you know, a uh, semitone tone. But, but it's, it's a combination. Cool. It's a combination of those keys. It's a that combination of tones and semitones. All right, uh, check out uh, Secret Squirrel's uh, question up above at 634. Uh, does each key signature have a unique quantity of sharps and flats? Yes, they do. Um, now, I think I've shown the, the circle of fifths diagram before. Yes. Um, and you'll notice on that diagram, if you go in one direction, if you go clockwise around that circle, you start off adding sharps, and then you get to six o'clock position, and you have six sharps, but you also have six flats, because there's the crossover point here between sharps and flats is at six o'clock on, on that diagram. And then if you keep going in that kind of clockwise direction, you start with six flats and then you start subtracting flats. You go six, five, four, three, two, one, and then up to 12 o'clock where you have no sharps and no flats. Um, so, so if we're to start with C, which is 12 o'clock, C major has no sharps, no flats. We go to one o'clock, we have one sharp, which is G major, two sharps, D major. Yep, you've got the diagram right there. And then uh, three o'clock is A major, which has three sharps. Then you have four sharps, E major. Then you have B major. Now, this particular diagram has a different crossover point. Really? Because it also includes the, the key signature of C flat major. C flat major is technically possible, but it's a little bit more of a, um, uh, of a theoretical key. It does... It, kind of exists, um, and that has seven flats in it, all right? So B major has five sharps, um, and but it can also be referred to as C flat major, which would have um, seven flats. And the screen has gone very yeah, dark. Yeah, yeah, I'm, I'm getting up. <laughs> uh, it didn't quite work the way that I had said it. <laughs> Oh, uh, yeah, it didn't work. It didn't work the way I intended. It didn't, I, um, it didn't. I, I tried to bring in uh, that image, and it is not. Oh, it's fine. Just just kind of cover over my face. It's oh. fine. <laughs> I don't want to do that. Nobody needs to look at my face for the whole hour. All right. All right. Yeah. So hold on. Let me let me actually go back. I just tried to do something. Thank you, folks, for your patience. <laughs> let me get back to Johnny. And get back to... <laughs> As Charlie Dillon says, is live, folks. Yes. Yes, it is. There we go. <laughs> yeah, so, yeah, by all means, cover my complete face. <laughs> and... <laughs> no, I don't. I'm not going to do that. All right, so, oh, where is it? It's over my... Um... It's oh, over no. your right shoulder. Over my right shoulder. So where do we get to? We got to five sharps, which is B major, um, which also can be called uh, C flat major, which would have seven flats. And then... Six o'clock is the kind of more traditional crossover point, which is where you have G flat major or F sharp major. Seeing as we're going in the sharps direction just now, we'll refer that to F sharp major. And that has six sharps. But it's also the crossover point. So it's also G flat major with um, 
two, four, six flats. And then as I say, if you keep going round, the next one will be D flat major. That has five flats, so we're now going down in flats. Oh, interesting. And then we get to A flat major, which has four flats. Then E flat major has three. B flat major has two. F major has one. And then you're back up the top. Now, notice in the center of that diagram, under each capital letter, there's a small letter. Yes. A lowercase letter. Those are the relative minor keys. So C major is um, uh, the relative major of A minor. And uh, as you can see, those um, all have equally similar kind of relationships to each other. Um, so you can travel either clockwise or anti-clockwise on this circle of fifths. Doesn't really matter which, which way you want to go. Um, but these are all your key signatures. And how are those derived? Those are derived the way I showed you here. So by taking that major scale, um, we, know, we now know its composition. We've gone over this a couple of times. But now if I start that major scale, but if I start it on E, which we now know has four sharps, but let's say we don't know that it has four sharps. We're just looking at that chart going, really? Does it have four sharps? How do we know? Let's test it. We've got to have a tone next. So we can't have F because that's a semitone. So we've got to have F sharp. We've got to have another whole tone. And then we have a half. And then we have another hole. And then we have another hole. And then we have another hole. And then we have the half up to the octave. F sharp, A sharp, C sharp, and D sharp. And guess what? If you look in the key signature for E major there, that has four sharps. Those are those four sharps I just referred to. And we worked that out because we know how a C major, how a major scale is made up. And we just started that same thing on E. And that gave us those, those, um, those four sharps. All right. And so that's, that's how those key signatures are all derived. That They're not arbitrary. They're all kind of worked out. <laughs> Pay no attention to the man behind the curtain, says Kyle. Yeah, right. <laughs> <laughs> yeah it's not as easy. On my uh, PC, it was a little bit easier to bring in pictures and stuff. On Mac, it's not because you got to double click to get into Windows. I had to get into oh, uh, different true. windows, yeah. I should say. That's so true. there you go. No, Johnny, that was perfect. Yeah. So I'm sorry I couldn't pull that up faster. That's <laughs> right. no problem. But there you go. All right. Let's see. We got about 15 minutes left here in the show. I, I am going and secret squirrel says super useful ah he said super useful uh let me go back up the thing f and awesome has a question he says learning basic major scale theory opens many doors uh that it completely changed the way i write oh interesting uh, yep. Learning the circle of fifths in the order of sharps is is the next step to transposing keys. Yeah, really, really helpful. Inter interesting. Yeah, really helpful because, I mean, here's the thing. There are instruments that are not pitched in the same key that the, the piano is. Right. Um, piano is, is widely regarded as a, a concert pitch, in, pitch instrument. It's essentially in C major. Right. Right? But you have things like alto saxophone that are in E flat major. You have tenor saxophone, which is in B flat. Trumpet is also in B flat. Um, you know, you have uh, tuba, which is in, uh, I think tuba is, um, no, tuba is a concert pitch instrument, I think, for the most part. I think it's only in brass band where it's regarded as a B-flat instrument. But in orchestra, it's regarded as a C instrument. There, see? There's different yeah, traditions. Yeah, so, so, so here's, here's a, maybe a silly question. Why, mm -hmm. why is that? Is there... because <laughs> the reason why transposing instruments exist, which is what we've, we've just referred to here, yeah. is because of the way those instruments are designed. So they're designed to be pitched in a different key. Oh, so the reason why transposing exists is to compensate for that so that everybody can play together. Right. And the Studio One uh, staff view and, and the music view, that, that has the options to uh, 
you know, to transpose yeah. the view so that you know what you're doing with a certain song in a certain key, right? That's correct. Right. Yes. Yeah. So, for example, here's, here's um, something to think about. So let's just take trumpet because trumpet's really simple. Trumpet's in B flat. So because it's in B flat, when you play a C on the piano and you tell your trumpet player, play me a C, Bob, and he plays the note below that, and you go, <laughs> Oh, that doesn't work, does it? <laughs> and the reason why it doesn't work is because his C is a B flat. Wow. Okay? So That's a lot do, to absorb. <laughs> how do we get him to play the same note as us? How do we get him to play this C? Right. Well, simple. We've worked out that when we tell him to play a C, he plays a B flat. That means he's playing a whole step lower than the piano. So that being true, if I want him to play a C, the same C as me, I need to tell him, play me a D. So when he plays a D on his trumpet, out comes a C, because he his instrument is a tone lower than mine. So I have to tell him to play a tone higher than me. And that is essentially how transposing works. So... Trumpet is the easiest one to kind of start with to understand. Um, so their tuning is a limitation of their design? Yes. Interesting. I never would have guessed that. Never yeah. would have guessed so, that. So, I mean, you know, it gets a little bit more complicated when, when you talk about <laughs> tenor saxophone. Tenor saxophone is also in B flat. But here's the thing. It's an octave lower than the trumpet. <laughs> ah! <laughs> so because it's an octave lower than the trumpet, you can't tell him to play an, a whole tone up from you. You have to tell him to play a whole octave plus a tone up from you to make the same note. Wow. <laughs> uh, Shorty Beard actually says, I do this constantly with guitar because I kept it in D standard instead of E, e standard. And you know yeah. what? That yeah. If you if you detune your instrument, if you can, like you can with guitar, learning popular songs now becomes you know like digging a hole with a uh, with a teaspoon. You know, it just it just kind of really screws up your whole. You know, you can't just get a book, you know, and say play these chords, and you got your song. No, no, exactly, because you've got to be aware of the fact that if you if you want your mate who's an alto sax player to come and jam with you and you're playing this song that's in G, well, he's if he plays in G, it's going to sound weird because he's going to be playing in a completely different key right. okay. and it's not going to work. So because you're in G, you need to tell him to play in E because okay. he needs to play a whole major sixth higher than you okay so now here's a, here's an interesting question if you're a guitar player and you're playing with someone on a saxophone yep. can you use a capo to get you guys in the same tune or is the arrangement of the strings that much different at that point it doesn't work like that you oh, can't damn <laughs> guitar to match the saxophone you have to transpose the saxophone to match the guitar because the guitar is the concert pitch instrument oh i oh. see Although, here's a small little catch. There's always a catch, isn't there? Oh, but I'm tired of caveats. <laughs> here's, here's the caveat. Not many people realize this, but a guitar is a transposing instrument. Oh? Yes, it is. <laughs> because you write for it an octave above its actual pitch. And that's, <laughs> just, that's just to make the, the reading of guitar music easier. Oh, wow. That's because otherwise you'd have, you'd have lots of what we call ledger lines, which are these right. tiny little lines that you get the notes sitting kind of on on top <laughs> of or sitting right in the middle of. And if you've got like loads of these things, you're having, you're, you're having to count the ledger lines. Okay, yeah, right. Look. Okay, that means that means, okay, so that's a ninth above the, 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 the top line of the stave there. You yeah. don't really be doing that. <laughs> I have to laugh at my, my good friend Wayne. Uh, he says, uh, I'll stick with playing drums, thanks. <laughs> <laughs> you know, well, and I, started out playing, I started out playing drums. Yeah, and then but I, I, I have to point out Wayne Goldman is one of my truest best friends from high school. 
and we were in bands together and jammed together. We wrote songs together, and then the guy had the balls to move away. <laughs> <laughs> now I have no one, uh, but uh, I'm so glad to see him here, Wayne. I just wanted to say hi. Uh, it's good to see you, man. All right, so let's see. We got 10 minutes in uh, here. All right. Bobby, Bobby says here, he says, I'll stick to mixing. And you know what? That's absolutely <laughs> fine. But guess what? Even this is even all of this, don't dismiss it because it's yeah. going to help you understand what is going on in the song so that you can actually best, you know, kind of adjust your mix to suit what is what's yes. coming out of the speakers. Yes, you can you can do it using your golden ears. And Bobby has the most golden of golden <laughs> yes, ears. Yes, he does. <laughs> but, you know, here's the here's the thing, you know, take that that you've got here and add some extra knowledge and insight into what makes music work. And you can really start to get creative with things like automation because you can go, you know what, when the, when that horn section does that little Sforzando swell, you can use some automation to accentuate that. Yeah. Yeah. You know, and there or are, you can, you can listen to the song and say, Oh, that might, yeah. that when, when the piano goes from the chord one to the saddest chord of all the four minor, you can accentuate that. You can drench that in reverb and really bring out the emotion in that four minor chord because you know it's function. Yes. Yeah, I was going to say, you know, and Bob, he still comes here for all of this. This is where he gets his knowledge. Yep. And I think it's in enough bites to where we get the, we get the most that a lot of us can out of it. Um, but what I wanted to add is uh, Leon over on Wix uh, makes a comment where he says, he goes, you know, I know a lot of musician drummers who actually tune their drums to the songs they play in. Now that's yep. now that's interesting. You know, I've heard of tuning drums to fit a song, but Leon says, you know, tuning it to the notes being played in the song, especially instrument, uh, especially toms and timpani drums. Well, timpani drums are pitched percussion instruments, so yes. they have to be tuned yeah. to to actual pitches. Right. But there, I, I would say even just playing a standard drum set, there is definitely value in tuning your kick drum to the fundamental tone of the song. So if, you're, if your song is in G, why not tune your kick drum so that it, it actually you know plays that tone? I never would have thought of that. <laughs> because it will just add a little bit of weight to to you know that's that sense of where home is in the song i'm gonna have to try that now it, it'd be easy to do with electronic drums because you can literally figure out the pitch of a particular drum sample and then yep. tune it and kyle jedrusiak as only kyle jedrusiak can do says you can tune a piano but you can't tune a fish thank you <laughs> thank you for that all right, yeah, we, we got fish like fishes. Um, fishes like scales, right? Fishes, yeah. Oh, ah, <laughs> uh, let's see. Brett Marler says many horn know what they have. Uh, I, I don't know. You, you, <laughs> you're using a little bit of. Uh, I, I think your uh, keyboard isn't working quite. Uh, uh, there, says, Brett. Many, horn, many horns know what they have to transpose from concert pitch. Yes, many horn players do. He's right. Um, you know, many many um, saxophone players, trombonists, trumpet players, they all know how transposing works because they live with it as, on a daily basis. So they know how it works. And actually a lot of really, really good um, horn players, they will transpose on site. So you can give them a concert pitch chart and 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 they will uh they will transpose you know instantly right right all right so <laughs> uh let's see nick foreign posted something and, and 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 i read it wrong the first time but i think i understand what he means now he says what's up everyone everyone hey i know the guy on the left he hosts a persona sphere live meets uh sometimes good to see you two hanging out together now, now that could be you being on the left side of me or you actually being on the left politically. So I wasn't sure how to take that at first. And in either case, you're right. <laughs> well, yeah, we, we both host um, Studio Meetup. Yes. Yeah, we, yeah we, you we, host the Illinois one and yeah. I host UK one. Yep, exactly. And uh, you are on the left politically. And I wouldn't say I'm on the right. I'm kind of, uh, I'm, I'm kind of uh, you know, 
dancing on the on the middle there somewhere. But I, I just thought it was an interesting comment. And he says, no, I meant the screen orientation. <laughs> of course, that's what he yeah, meant. Of course it is. I just had to point that out because I thought it was fun. Don't. All right, don't. <laughs> Johnny and his echo. All <laughs> right. So let's see here. All right. So like uh, Leon has another question here. He says, all right, so if I tune my guitar to an open chord, how does that affect my ability to work with other musicians? Oh, I love I love questions about guitar tuning. Oh, that's a good one. It, it's great. Um, and actually, quite often, I, I know of guitarists that do this. And in fact, your mate Tom does this. Yes, he does. He yes. absolutely does this. And w you know what I like about that the most? He is blissfully unaware of this. Uh, <laughs> at least I think he's blissfully unaware of it. I'm, I'm going to have to ask him yeah. and see see if he is. But And, and if he's not, this is even better. Um, but when you tune the, the guitar strings to a particular chord, so let's say you tune it to, I think Tom likes, likes things like A flat major, right? Yes, so, exactly. Mm -hmm. So let's say he tunes his guitar to an A flat major chord. When he plays a different guitar sh uh, chord shape, so he may may well play like a, a D major seven shape, which is kind of like this, I suppose. And then he plays this on his guitar. He's going to get some different notes. Um, that's not going to be a D major chord. It's not necessarily even going to be an A flat major chord. <laughs> yeah, right, it's exactly. going to be a completely different sound. Now, here's the thing that he's done. What he has done is he has said, my guitar is going to play a mode. Oh, interesting. And then any chords that I make, any chord shapes that I make are going to be obviously derived from this mode. And if I move a, a, a shape up and down the neck, I'm going to get particular chords and particular clusters of tones. Right. Sometimes he only uses uh, two fingers to do all of these different. Yeah, things. he probably does. And then he's got the others as like open uh, strings. So like they're drums. Yes. yes. Yeah. Uh, I've, I've heard him do that. I think on um, uh, one of one of the songs, I think I, I think, did I play bass on one of his songs? Ah, uh, yes, you did. Uh, yeah, way I think early. One of his, yeah, and it took me a while to figure out what he was doing because I, I at first I wasn't aware that he was he, he was using like unusual tunings. I had to listen to the song a couple of times and I go, "Oh, he's tuned his guitar to an A flat major chord." <laughs> and as soon as I did that, it was just like doing the you bass part knew, right. the because I didn't have to think about chords anymore. Right, because you were in a mode exactly yeah. i could no i didn't have to sit down and, and work out the chord changes because i'd started working out the chord changes going well, these chords don't really relate to each other <laughs> no they don't and as soon as as soon as i went oh he's tuned the guitar to a flat major this is a flat ionian mode <laughs> i threw the chord chart away yeah right and you can just improvise flat. You and just... I just started playing. All I needed yeah. to do was play an A flat major, and I knew every note would fit. It didn't matter. It would fit. That is so cool. All right. It looks like there is a meetup. Yes, in about an hour's time, I believe. Okay, very cool. If somebody has a link to that, please post it in the chat. Oh, and speaking of the chat, really quick here. I need to let you yeah, guys know. I need to let you guys know of something here that I discovered. Uh, when you guys actually watch the replay, I get a lot of people saying, Johnny, there's something wrong. The chat is not showing when I replay it. I found out from YouTube that it takes up to 24 hours for the chat to show up in a recorded show. So yep. it, it, there are times where it shows up right away. I've got I've had a couple show up right away. But for the most part, it takes 24 hours yep, for the chat right. to show up. And I went back through the last uh, uh, 15 or 20 live streams, and the chat is there in all of them. So if you have any issues, send the email to the email you see right here, johnny at hst-homestudiotrainer.com. That is where uh, you can, uh, your questions, complaints, whatever you have, um, or you can just post under, uh, you know, in the comments for this live stream. And uh, let's see, Nick uh, Ferran says, that's kind of weird. I wonder why that is. I don't know. 
I don't know, but it was really becoming an issue for some of the people that can't watch the show, especially like the midnight show. So the midnight show for me is like six o'clock in the morning for Johnny. So, you know, <laughs> it's a, it, that's going to be kind of weird if you get up six o'clock in the morning and, or at seven o'clock in the morning, your time, and you play the show and the chat's not there. That's because it takes a full 24 hours, 20 to 24 hours. Okay, that works too. All right, Johnny, I want to say thanks, man. What a great show. A lot of awesome information. Yeah, it's, you know, these these shows where we just kind of go into into kind of some basics of, uh, I mean, we, we it was more kind of ask, answering music theory questions than sure. covering basics, but we did do a little bit. We did we yeah. did some on, on major scales and how to how to form them and and you know basically move them about and that's how you discover different key centers. Oh sure. So we kind of did that, which is which is I think pretty important for everybody to to have a um, a grasp of. But uh, right. we should do these kind of things a wee bit more so that we can cover a wee bit more ground and also get so. you know more questions out of a few other people because you know there there were some great questions don't get me wrong but yeah. you know i would like to see some some more people different people asking some of their their questions yes exactly all right folks if you guys could visit my patreon site uh, the link is down below if you want to support the channel yep. uh, or you can follow the paypal link and uh, just make a regular donation i've even got a couple of paypal folks that actually donate like 10 bucks a month through paypal so that works well too whatever you guys want to do whatever you guys feel is the safest uh, for your money handling I appreciate it. And there's music to motions link to the zoom link. And I'm going to see if I can pop over there. If I don't have to go to work early, Johnny, thank you so much. Hi, this has been fun. Uh, yeah. Thank you everybody for your, your great questions. And we will revisit this whole music theory thing for sure. Sure. Actually say goodbye to the folks now in only the way you can. Toodaloo. When was the last day? What? When was the last time I heard somebody say toodaloo? <laughs> oh, 1937. Yeah, I think so. I think it was some John Wayne movie. I think so. But anyway. <laughs> <laughs> all right, Johnny, have a good one. Yes, I shall be gone with the wind. <laughs> yes, exactly. Goodbye. Nice reference. <laughs> Love it. Ooh. All right, Johnny is gone, and I am done. Voices just, and I didn't get, I didn't talk much, and I can still barely speak right now. All right, everybody, have a good night. I will be back tomorrow. Hey, oh, I'm sorry about not being able to do the show yesterday. Uh, my father had an accident at the nursing home, and I had to rush out there. And he's okay. He's okay. Uh, just something I had to uh, I had to make sure that he was okay out there. So uh, sorry about that. I, I hate canceling shows at the last minute. So tomorrow is Thursday. It is time for Studio One Six Tips and Tricks, and I will see you tomorrow at 6 o'clock. You guys have a good one. These are going to be my last few words. Later. The HST Alps Media Advantage. HST brings you the training, and Alps Media provides special pricing to HST subscribers on PreSona Studio One software and associated hardware you need for your home studio. PreSona, HST, and Alps Media, helping each other make music together.